Good morning. Will all of our visitors please stand? Amen. <laughs> On behalf of Pastor Harshaw, the pulpit ministers, and members of Trinity, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you. We appreciate your presence, and I pray that you will become part of our worship and praise to the Lord this morning. If you do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to know him. If you are looking for a church home, I invite you to join us. This morning, you are sharing in the beginning of a very special celebration of how God has blessed Trinity for 75 years. I cordially invite you to continue sharing with us on Wednesday, November the 11th at 7 p.m. for our free Gospel Music Fest, and on next Sunday at 7.30 a.m. services, where Pastor Harshaw will bring the message, at 10.30 services, where Dr. Elliot J. Mason Sr., our Pastor Emeritus, will bring the message, and at 4 p.m. on Sunday for the ordination dedication of our deacons. Again, welcome to Trinity. Thank you for celebrating with us, and please, Come again. Thank you. Truly, Trinity Baptist Church does, in fact, as a congregation as well as individuals, love the Lord. And at this time, we pause to say good morning to those of you listening by radio. This is the 10.30 a.m. worship service of Trinity Baptist Church. Trinity is located at 2040 West Jefferson Boulevard in Los Angeles. This is a very special Sunday for the entire Trinity family. You see, one November, 75 years ago, this church was founded by a group of children and adults meeting for Sunday school. And here we are, blessed to be together 75 years later, worshiping and praising God. Those of you who are listening, you still have the opportunity to join us as the celebration continues on next Sunday, November the 15th, as Pastor Harshaw brings the word at 7.30, and then we will be excited to welcome to the pulpit our own pastor emeritus, Dr. Elliot J. Mason, Sr., who will deliver the message at our 10.30 a.m. worship service. And then a culminating service at 4 p.m. has been planned for next Sunday, at which time Pastor Harshaw will deliver the message and the new deacons will be ordained. 
Earlier in our service today, the Reverend Eugene Marzette led us as we read responsibly from Psalm 111. Leading us in worship through song are the voices of Trinity's combined choirs. The pastor of Trinity Baptist Church is the Reverend Dr. Dumas Alexander Harshaw, Jr. And we have a very special speaker this morning joining with us, Dr. William Pinnell from Fuller Theological Seminary, and Pastor Harshaw will be introducing him in just a moment. I am Reverend Stephen Murphy. We continue now in worship and praise as we will have the introduction of our speaker for the morning, Dr. Pinnell. Here is Pastor Harshaw. Thanks so much, Reverend Murphy. I appreciate this opportunity to present to you such an outstanding servant of our Lord uh, who comes to us uh, this morning. And, uh, you have the biographical sketch uh, in the bulletin uh, before you, but uh, for the sake of those who will be listening through tape, through video, we will share that information. And Dr. William E. Pinnell is uh, now the, the author, uh, Christ Church Oak Brook professor of, of preaching and practical theology and also the dean of the chapel. Uh, that's part of uh, his responsibilities. He has uh, served as an associate professor of evangelism at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena. California and uh, has also served as the director of the Black Ministries at Fuller and has done a marvelous job through the years. Uh, Dr. Pinnell received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Fort Wayne Bible College in Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana. Uh, he also studied Black History studies at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan and received his Master of Arts degree from the University of Southern California in Social Ethics. His experience include lecture on Methods of Evangelism Conference, Commission on World Mission and Evangelism in Geneva, Switzerland. He delivered the Berger uh, Lectures on Preaching at Dubuque Theological Seminary and was lecturer at Emmanuel School of Religion, Staley Foundation Lecturer at George Fox College, Newburgh, Oregon, and Simpson College in San Francisco, California. He has been the speaker at United States Consultation on Simple Lifestyles in Vent, Nor, New Jersey, as well as many other national and global gatherings. Some of Dr. Pinnell's published works include My Friend the Enemy, Our Society in Turmoil, Evangelical Social Concern, International Review of Mission, The Urban Mission, The Evangelicals, Mission Trends, and Living More Simply, uh, Biblical Principle and Practical Models. Dr. Pinnell's latest work published this year is entitled Evangelism from the Bottom Up. Dr. Pinnell is a member of the Delta Epsilon Chi uh, Honor Society of the Accrediting Association of Bible Colleges and received a Doctor of Divinity degree from the Malone College. He serves on the boards of Youth for Christ USA, Communication Ministries, and the Academy of Evangelism. Dr. Pinnell is married to Hazel Pinnell, and they are the proud parents of two sons, Philip and Peter. We're certainly overjoyed to have uh, this great professor of theology and uh, dean of the chapel of Fuller Theological Seminary to, to come with us uh, this morning and to celebrate the journey of what God has done. And he has had such an outstanding ministry across the years. I met him many, many years ago. When he, he worked with the Tom Skinner ministry through Reverend Ed Bryant at the Pasadena Youth Christian Center, and I uh, have respected him through uh, the year, through the years, and uh, know that God is going to use him in a mighty way. And uh, he has done an extraordinary job at Fuller Theological Seminary and touched the lives of thousands and thousands of students who are in leadership around the world. And so uh, we know that the Lord has anointed him in a special way. And so, uh, following the presentation from our choir, the next voice you hear will be that of the Dr. William E. Pinnell.
Amen. Amen. Pastor Harshaw, and I know there's only one. Um, thank you for inviting me this morning, this particular morning, to my fellow ministers in the gospel, to those of you who are members of this congregation and friends, I'm very pleased to be here and to participate in this remarkable achievement. I was telling Pastor Harshaw, if you were not a Christian and you have grave doubts, perhaps even about God's existence, one of the ways to be convinced is to take note of the fact that in spite of human nature, the church still exists. That's not an inconsiderable insight. For nearly 2,000 years, the church has survived. <laughs> that doesn't tell you something about God. Forget it. You have supplied the theme for my sermon. What you didn't supply for me was my text. So I've had to pray about that and look to the Lord for some guidance on that one. And the Lord has led me, I believe, to a very familiar story recorded several times in the Gospels and very familiar to all of you. Let me read it from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 4 and verse 35. Jesus has been teaching all day long. I don't know how the message got out, but thousands of people came to hear him teach. So much so that they crowded him off the beach. And he decided to make his pulpit a little boat in which he sat, pushed it out a little from the shore, and all day long taught multitudes of people. They came from all over the place, and they sat on the shore right down to the water line. All day long, he preached and he taught in parables about the kingdom of God. They hung on every word. And those of you who teach, and indeed those of you who listen to teachers know that that can be a very fatiguing experience. Try teaching all day long. Try listening all day long. That incredible thing that happens between teacher and taught, the dynamics at work there, after the day is over, you are tired. When evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great storm of wind arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we perish? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace. Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And they were filled with awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Three questions out of a storm. There is this about an anniversary. It's an opportunity to look backward and to trace the hand of God upon your collective life. There have been glorious times in that history, and there have been some inglorious times in that history, and we will look at both, I'm sure. 
but we will tend to remember the good times. It's kind of like a 50th wedding anniversary. Any couple married that long has had some embarrassing times. Somebody has had to learn to weep and to repent and to confess and to be forgiven. And there's even probably been a little Christian cussing along the way. <laughs> Just a little, just a little, just a little. There have been times when the relationship might have seemed a bit wobbly, but if you have endured for 50 years and the children gather and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren and the church helps you celebrate and there's all kinds of good stuff to eat and some bubbly, you say, oh well, praise God. And those other times tend to be forgotten. And that's good. I can well imagine that when Jesus said to the disciples, let us go to the other side, the disciples were pleased. It was a time of new beginning. They had been there for a long time, all day long. And what they had done there, they had done very well. Jesus had taught in his immaculate style. People had listened. They were blessed out of their hearts and, and, and out of their experiences. Their hearts were blessed and warmed. The disciples were pleased because after all, this was a great movement which was beginning to gain more and more momentum. They were on the right side. Sooner or later, their master would ascend the throne of his father David and reign over the house of Jacob forever and they would be his prime ministers. They would sit on the right hand and on the left. Ah, oh, what a way to go. So I am sure that when Jesus said, let us go to the other side, they said, oh boy. <sighs> time for, a, and I suppose they could have been thinking that this is the time when we will rest a while. A little R&R. &R. Jesus has probably made contact with somebody over there that has a sauna. Surely, somebody has got a jacuzzi. Somebody has got a condo in the springs. Wonderful. He said, let's go. They got in the boat and went. Now, anniversaries are like that, too. They are times of reflection, but also opportunities to say, whew, we've made it thus far on the way. Let's at least take a week out and rest a little while. You've earned it. You really have earned it. The, the occasion, however, doesn't always lend itself to comfort. I don't know how long they were on the boat, or in the boat and on the sea, before the winds came up. And these are sailors and they are accustomed to wind. And they know how to negotiate wind. And they know how to tack, and they know how to handle waves, the rise and the fall. And so the wind didn't bother them much at the first, I'm sure, but pretty soon it became clear to, even to them this was no ordinary storm. In another place it says the winds were contrary. And some scholars have thought that there was an element of the demonic in those winds, an attempt perhaps of satanic forces to drown that crowd. After all, if you could drown those guys and their leader, you pretty well had the movement out of the way. These may have been those kinds of winds. There's something ominous in the storm. When sailors are afraid, it's time perhaps to take notice of the severity of the wind and the ferocity of the waves. The carpenter is asleep. The sailors are afraid. Now, you might not think that's unusual, but next time you're on an airplane going east and the turbulence bounces that thing, there's nothing to do but sit there. You can't get out and walk. <laughs> but supposing in the midst of all of that, you were to see the pilot come back through the cabin with his parachute on. <laughs> uh, 
Ah. When sailors are afraid, then it's time to take the storm seriously. I understand that the early church, in reading this and studying this, identified with this, perhaps as much if not more than almost any other story in the gospel account. This was their story. The early church was a church without power, without influence. They couldn't pick up the phone and call a councilwoman or a councilman. They couldn't pick up the phone and get the mayor's office. Their preachers were not in City Hall. Their evangelists had no access to the White House. They had no power, no place. They were the off-scouring of the earth. And politicians alike, rather than getting converted every two to four years like today, at least in time for the next election, the politicians of those days took turn, took delight in wiping them out. There was something about that early church that put people off. Men and women and young people did not rush into her arms saying, take me to your leader. This was an awesome group of people. And they were persecuted and cut down. They had absolutely nothing to stand on. Their only recourse, their only council, their only committee, their only board of trustees, if you will, was the Holy Trinity. And they would get before God when the storm blew and they would pray. It was a praying church and they read this story as their own story and they said, we understand what storms are about. We understand what this story is for because this is our story. Now, the Church of Jesus Christ today is in the midst of a storm, and it doesn't always even know it. We've been in a storm for hundreds of years. If you have studied it, you know what I mean. It comes under the heading of the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, that marvelous history of Western ideas which have shaped Western civilization and history and culture. You've studied anywhere from kindergarten up through the university. You've all been exposed to these ideas. They've shaped the way you think. And at times, if you weren't careful, even if you didn't know it, they have also alienated you from your faith. They at least have made a powerful assault on your faith. We celebrate it this marvelous history of Western culture in those opening words of the preamble to our Constitution. We, what is it? The people. There you go. That's Western culture and that's Western civilization and finally it gave us such great ideas as secularism. And that's why you can't trust God in your schools. And that's why you can't trust God really in your politics. Our president-elect will put his hand on the Bible, but let nobody really think seriously that that means that God is going to influence foreign policy. Let no one think that that means that God is going to influence economic theory. Let nobody think that's going to influence anything that goes down in the halls of government. What reigns in the halls of government is the enlightenment renaissance, all that good stuff which has given history such great ideas as capitalism and democracy, Marxism, individualism, freedom, hedonism, secularism, a sexual revolution, and finally, brothers and sisters, that marvelous enterprise that is called condoms after school. That's what it's come down to. It is symbolized in the crash of a wall in Berlin, the collapse of an ideology in Russia, the rise of 
the Balkan states and the Balkanization of whole countries. There are all kinds of ways to look at this, all kinds of ways to examine it, but the truth of the matter is, in the midst of it all, for hundreds and hundreds of years, the church has been facing into a storm of ideas, and we have not always known how to deal with them. It's a marvelous history. Let it be clear this morning, you will be influenced by ideas. Ideas matter. Ideas matter. That's why we send our young people to school, amen? Not simply to get a job, but because ideas matter. Let me ask you this, in the midst of a storm, what kind of ideas make a difference in your life? Ideas which, if taken seriously, could make a difference in the midst of a storm. Think about it. The church has gone under sometimes because it couldn't handle the storm of ideas. The church has gone under because it couldn't handle the avalanche of incidents which have caught up to it. After a while, life catches up to us. Just the sheer strength and power of incidences over which we have no control. Divorce, your best friend is gay or lesbian. You got drafted. And you ended up in the Middle East someplace. And when you got home, there wasn't anything to do. And people tied yellow ribbons around the old oak tree and it made no difference to you. Life catches up with us, and life catches up with the church. And the question which Jesus posed is an important one. Let me rehearse it for you one more time. What is it that scares you? Why are you afraid? They're obviously afraid because they are insecure. They are insecure. The waves are dashing against the boat. The water is filling the boat. They are about to go under. And they are powerless. And they have no security. America said the other day in its voting that it was more concerned about security than anything else. Called it change. But we voted our pocketbooks. And we ought to. If you're without a job, you're vulnerable. If you can't work, you're vulnerable. If your sons and daughters particularly can't work, can't find a job, if kids can't find a way through the morass, they're standing on the street corners. They are vulnerable. They are gripped with insecurity and fear, nameless fear and insecurity. Years ago, someone started a organization called Mass Motivational Research. It's been um, used by all kinds of people across the land for many years. And they said if we could reduce our insight into what makes people tick, we could sell them almost anything. And at that time, at least, they reduced human need, human wants, human motivations to about four things. Security, status, sustenance, and sex. The last one, I think, is why they make red convertibles. <laughs> they put them right, right in the middle of the showroom. That's what that's all about. You thought that was transportation, didn't you? You thought... He thought that was transportation. That isn't about transportation at all. Think of it. Security, sustenance, status. Appeal to that, you could sell people almost anything, they said. And political pundits and people who are strategists trying to get us to vote for their particular side work on the same sort of analysis. Give people what they need. Give them what they want. Find out what motivates them and sell it. 
You could have sold these guys almost anything that day. They were scared. They were vulnerable. They were afraid. When you are afraid, you are vulnerable. People can sell you anything when you're afraid. You really are off balance when you're afraid. Somehow or other, you've got to get a grip on your fears. But that's more easy to talk about than to do. That's why the second question that Jesus posed is a very important one. It's related to the first. Where is your faith? We have said this morning in song, and we have said in our scripture reading, and we have gathered together this morning because we do believe there is a connection between strong faith and overcoming fear. We believe there's a connection between a God who is good and who is available to us, who, if we would believe, would take care of our fears. So then why haven't you called upon him? Perhaps because, well, maybe perhaps the same reason the disciples didn't. I don't know how long it was before they decided to wake Jesus. I have no idea. But it wasn't right away. It wasn't right away. That storm was well on its way before they awakened the Son of God. That storm had gained considerable momentum. That storm had made significant impact upon their lives and upon that boat and upon their sense of security long before they called upon Jesus. And then all of a sudden they said, whoops, whoops. And they hadn't called upon him, I'm sure, because they thought up to that time they could handle it themselves, of course. You anticipated that, of course, when you don't pray. It's because you can handle it yourself. When you don't call on the, the name of the Lord, you don't need him. Obviously, prayerless people testify that they can handle it themselves. It's a kind of a practical atheism. A kind of a practical atheism. We can sprinkle it with a certain kind of Baptist holy water sometimes, or Presbyterian, or Methodist, or whatever. And we come to church and we go through the ritual, but we do not call on the name of the Lord, even in the midst of a storm, because we're quite convinced that as good sailors, we can handle it. But there comes a time when it's out of your control. It can get that way. Count on it. Hear Jesus ask you, where is your faith? What you do with it? You say, well, I had it once. <laughs> I had it once. Maybe you did and maybe you didn't. Maybe you had faith, sir, in your wife's name. I went fishing with an old man once. Wonderful man. We had a great time. He's a real pagan. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. And no time for God. He wasn't an atheist who said there is no God. He wasn't an agnostic who says I'm not sure. He was an agnostic. He wasn't sure even about the question. <laughs> and he parked his RV alongside of the lake in the little place up in Canada, and we had a wonderful time together. I stayed with him. Wonderful man. He had the biggest jug of gin I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Never seen anything like it in my whole life. I'd sit there drinking tonic water, and he'd sit there drinking gin. And by the time he would drink about half a gallon, it seemed like he was, he was ready to talk. And he just poured out his life. He was an amazing man. By the time the week was over, a great affection for this man. Powerful man. The thing that haunted this man. The thing that haunted this man. Every waking moment of his life was the godly, impeccable life of the woman a few years ago he had buried. His wife was the center of faith 
that kept this man from coming apart at the seams and now bereaved because she was gone. He had no place to stand. There are men like that. They say, I believe, but what they really mean is my faith really belonged to my wife. I know women the same way. I know young people and grandkids whose faith really isn't their own. It belonged to grandpa and grandma and Aunt Mary. Wonderful heritage, but it's not your faith. And in the storm, you are not going to make it. This last word, this last question, very important. It doesn't come from Jesus. It comes from a startled, stunned discipleship. He had risen from sleep. He had spoken words to the wind. He had silenced the waves. There was a dead calm. And out of that calm came the last question posed by the disciples to one another. Who in the world can this man be that even the winds obey him? You say, well, he's a teacher. Yes, indeed. Oh, is he ever a teacher? The Sermon on the Mount, all kinds of teachings about divorce, marriage, prayer. Ah, what a teacher. You say he's a preacher. He's that to be sure. Jesus could flat out preach. <laughs> Jesus could really preach. Great preacher. Jesus said, I came into the world to preach good news and he preached good news. Did he ever preach? And he himself was the sermon. Jesus could preach. He could heal people and he did that. The great healer. Touch your life, touch your body. Pow! He can bring healing in an instant. But in a storm, you need more than a preacher or a teacher or a healer. You need somebody who out from within himself, out of his own being, can look the wind in the eye and say, peace, and who can speak to the waves and say, shut up. And it works that way. You need somebody, in short, who is the Lord of creation, the Lord of redemption, who when you holler, he hears, and when he hears, he does something about it. Someone with power. Someone with power. Jesus who is Lord. Now I want to close with that word this morning because it's very important. You have prayed to Jesus as friend. You have prayed to Jesus kind of as fellow traveler. We've called him all sorts of things. Let me say to you out of this story, you are not really home until you pray to Jesus as Lord. That means you have turned over the reins of your life to Jesus. That means your life is now being lived under new management. That means that Jesus Christ has the reins of your whole existence. That means that Jesus Christ calls the shots in your life. That means you are no longer living for yourself, but unto him who loved you and gave himself for you. Jesus Christ commands the winds and they obey. He commands the waves and they obey. He speaks to people. He speaks to you and to me. And if we can, we'll fake it and not make it. We will say, let's talk about it. Let's delay that. Let's put that off. I'm not ready for that. Whether or not you stand up against the storms now and in the future, altogether depends upon who Jesus is. If Jesus is Lord and your Lord, you can make it to the other side. If he's just another teacher.
Praise the Lord. What a powerful word indeed. My Lord, my Lord. Praise the Lord. Great word of God. Praise the Lord. It is with great pleasure that I present to you Shonda Crable and Mark Featherstone, who will present highlights from the Do Dr. Jonathan Lyle casting era, which was the year 1936-1962. In 1936, the United States was still recovering from the Great Depression. In March of that year, Trinity Baptist Church experienced a tremendous blessing as it welcomed its sixth pastor, Dr. Jonathan Lyle Caston. Brother Paul Cassell wrote the letter of invitation asking Dr. Caston to join Trinity. Dr. Caston had previously pastored several churches, with the last being in El Central, California. During the 26 years that Reverend Caston served at Trinity, he brought the church to many victories. He also brought them through many obstacles, but always maintained his determination to go forth and overcome those obstacles. For instance, Reverend Caston fought the city of Los Angeles and caused them to live there white only restrictions for buying homes in the Arlington Park area where he and his wife, Inez Caston, soon resided. Dr. Caston was a distinguished leader in educational, civic, and political areas. He was a pioneer candidate for the City Council, 7th District, in 1947. Among the many significant changes in Trinity that took place during Dr. Caston's tenure, were the introduction of a new constitution for the church and the publishing of the Articles of Corporation in 1939. In 1940, Dr. and Mrs. Caston were married in Riverside, California. Mrs. Caston worked faithfully with her husband in many areas of the church she served as organist for the Celestial Choristers and the Cathedral Choir, later becoming directress of the Inez C. Caston Gospel Chorus, a group organized by Henry P. Markham. In September of 1942, Dr. Caston led the Trinity Congregation into the Japanese Methodist Church on 35th in Normandy. At this location, membership increased by hundreds, and Trinity soon outgrew the church. After a few years, the Japanese started returning from the concentration camps, so Dr. Caston led the congregation back to the original Trinity at 36th in Normandy in April of 1945. Upon returning to Old, to old Trinity, Dr. Caston had a vision, a vision of a brand new Trinity consisting of three large structures, the sanctuary, the recreational building, and the educational building. Brother Paul Williams was to be the architect and Brother Paul Cassell the, con the contractor. In 1945, 10 lots were purchased at Jefferson and Cimarron. Trinity would go on to stay at 36th in Normandy for three more years, but on April 4th of 1948, Trinity participated in one of its most glorious and historical events as Dr. Caston led a colorful parade from Old Trinity to the new site he had envisioned just three years before. This occasion was the groundbreaking for the erection of the Jonathan Lyle, or J.L. Caston Center. The building was completed with the laying of the cornerstone in 1948. When Dr. Caston's health began to fail, he began to look for someone to take his place as pastor of Trinity. In 1959, Dr. Horace Mays suggested a young man by the name of Elliot J. Mason to be his successor. On January 15, 1962, Dr. Caston gave his resignation message, and Dr. Mason went on to become the seventh pastor of Trinity in April of the same year. You'll have to come back next Sunday to um, hear the historical highlights of that period. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Jonathan Lyle Caston was not only a minister, but a teacher, community leader, organizer, builder, humanitarian, and most of all, a man of God. One of the many gifts that God bestowed upon Reverend Caston was the gift of speech. His sermons were not only spirit-filled and inspiring, but almost revolutionary as well. He was definitely a man before his time. I would like to quote a small paragraph from one of Reverend Caston's speeches that I feel is very appropriate for our 75th anniversary. As we turn from the past to the future, may the memories of yesterday bring oil to the lamp of our hopes for all the days ahead. May you, wa may you wisely leave behind all that would mar your peace and progress and carry forward only that which makes life happier and, a be and better for yourselves and others. Thank you. Now we're going to have our special presentations led by the chairman of the History Committee, Brother Price. Let the church say amen. amen. Let's thank these wonderful presenters one more time, please. Praise God. First, giving honor to, to God, to Pastor Harsha, to Dr. Pennell, to the ministers on the rostrum, distinguished guests, to Trinity Baptist Church. It's a great honor to share in the blessed occasion at this historic place and time in the life of Trinity Baptist Church. As chairman of the 75th Anniversary History Committee, I'm especially renewed by the great historical legacy we share in the journey where pioneers like Ollie Green, Marguerite Fletcher, Cynthia Pittman, and trailblazers like Violet Wilson, Hattie Abell, Paul Cassell, Bernice Floyd, and countless other men and women of Trinity paved the way for us through Christian love and dedicated service. On behalf of the 75th Anniversary General Committee, we're privileged and honored to recognize and salute these pioneers and trailblazers of Trinity Baptist Church. Will the General Chairperson of the 75th Anniversary Committee, Maddie Gordet, and Pastor Harshaw, please join me in making these presentations. Incidentally, earlier at the 7.30 service, we made presentations to the distinguished Paul Cassell. Mr. Cassell, would you stand? We also made presentations to Marguerite Hort Fletcher. Would you stand, Mrs. Fletcher? And other distinguished re recipients were Ollie Green and Hattie Abell. We thank you so much for that presentation earlier this morning. Now, the first Distinguished Christian Service Award at the 1030 service is presented to Cynthia Pittman. Will you please come forward, Mrs. Pittman? Mrs. Pittman, as she come forward, has been a member of Trinity since 1928. She is the daughter of Gus Smith, deacon, board of trustees, the granddaughter of Virginia Jack, deaconess, chairperson. The family gave the first pulpit Bible to the church. On behalf of the 75th anniversary, we'd like to present this Distinguished Christian Service Award. And I'll read the first inscription for you, presented to Cynthia Pittman in recognition of faithful Christian service and appreciation for valuable contributions given to Trinity Baptist Church, Los Angeles, from 1928 to 1992. November the 8th. <laughs> Trinity Baptist Church, 75th anniversary, Dr. Dumas, A. Hartshaw, Jr., Pastor. Yes. Our second recipient is Violet Wilson. I'm not sure. Violet Wilson. As Violet comes forward, she's been a member, dedicated worker of Trinity since 1931. The daughter herself of a pioneer, Maddie Austin, member of the Inez Caston Gospel Chorus. And our other distinguished recipient, Bernice Floyd. I'm not, she's in the choir. 
As Bernice Floyd come forward, she's been a member of Trinity since 1935. As you can see, senior choir member, Sunday School. Distinguished Christian Service Award presented to Bernice Floyd in recognition of faithful Christian service from 1935 to 1992. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank Thee for this day of praising and giving You the praise. And we ask that Thou would, as we depart from this place, one from another to our places of abode, we ask that Thou would give us the companionship of the Holy Spirit to lead, direct, and guide us until we meet again. <clears throat> 